Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our second presentation over Skype. This is um, the May um, equivalent of our regular meeting. Um, obviously, the enforced conditions with the lockdown are causing us to have to work this way. Um, but hopefully, you know, it's getting out to a few more people and you're all enjoying the content that, we that we're putting out for you. Now, this evening, our presentation is from a very old friend of mine, um, a gentleman from the BTS, the British Tyrannical Society. Um, he's the show organiser and also the vice chairman now of the, of the society. Um, his name's Ray Hale. Now, Ray has done a lot of work across Indonesia. Um, he's got a very, very um, big interest in genetic diversity and also in the theories of evolution. Um, his talk this evening is um, based on his search for a particular species. Um, so I think Becky's going to start the talk for us because Ray's pre-recorded it for us. Um, and tonight his talk is the search for Wallace's spider. Um, and we'll hand over to Ray whenever Becky's ready to start it. Good afternoon or good evening and welcome to this, uh, my lecture for the West Midlands Herpetological Society. This is pretty new to me to be honest, narrating lectures via the internet, but perhaps this is the shape of things to come. My lecture today um, is literally about this man. I'm sure most of you won't actually recognise him, but he is in fact Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, Alfred Russell Wallace was a contemporary of Darwin, and to be honest, without Wallace, uh, we would not really have the understanding of the natural world that we have now. Most people tend to um, think of evolution they think of Charles Darwin, of course. But the harsh reality is that without, without this man, Alfred Russell Wallace, Charles Darwin may well have never have written his amazing theory of evolution by natural selection. But that's a story for another day. My lecture this evening really concerns a simple question. Did Wallace or Darwin collect spiders during their long voyages? And tonight, I hope to answer that question. I lecture, therefore, the search for Wallace's spider, a Victorian mystery. The thing to remember when we talk about Wallace is Wallace was a visionary well ahead of his time. And in 1869, he wrote this. Should man ever reach these distant lands, you may be sure that he will so disturb the delicate balance and he will cause their disappearance and ultimately their extinction. How right he was. Having travelled the tropics for over 30 years, I've seen at least a 50% reduction in rainforest in that time. So not only was Wallace a great entomologist, a naturalist, he was also a visionary. But before we start, I will introduce you to these two great men. On the left, of course, is the great icon of natural history, Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin, of course, gave us his groundbreaking work, The Origin of Species, the book that I recommend that you read if you read nothing else, particularly in these long days of lockdown. But to the right of Darwin, we see Alfred Russell Wallace, who gave us a fantastic um, work called The Malay Archipelago. Two books well worth seeking out, and incidentally, both books have never been out of print. Now, when I was a young man growing up, a maiden aunt gave me a copy of The Origin of Species as a young man, probably about 12. And with it, she knowingly said to me, one day you will have to make a choice. Being 12 or 13, I really had no interest in any book written by a, a man with a dodgy beard. And so the book went on the shelf and there he stayed. It was only years later 
when I actually realised I had a passion for natural history, that I came across that book. And I read it, and it had a profound effect upon my life. But on the very front page of that book, Darwin mentions someone, Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, Darwin could have mentioned any of the people he had um, contact with in his research, but no, he chose Alfred Russell Wallace, a simple naturalist, entomologist, insect collector, working out in the Far East. And my question I needed to know was why on earth did Darwin, who was one of the great and good of the time, would pay such homage to such a simple man? And my work and my research has taken me far and wide to find out why. If we then look at the voyages of Wallace and Darwin, we will see to the green, on the green line, you will see the voyage of Darwin. Now, most people tend to think that Darwin spent most of his life travelling the world. Actually, that's not true. He spent five years of his life on, aboard the Beagle. And if we look at the green line, he went from England to South America, around past the Falkland Islands. He went through the Galapagos, circumnavigated the world, arrived at Australia, and eventually, by the Cape, um, Cape Town, returned back to England. Five years. Wallace, on the other hand, travelled originally from England to Brazil, spent some length of time out there, returned to England, and then later went on to visit Southeast Asia, particularly the Malaysian archipelago, or the Indonesian archipelago as it is now, and he was to spend eight years of his in this area. So, when we look at the voyage of the Beagle and Charles Darwin, we see just some of the notes and the, the work that Darwin put into that book, a fantastic book and one I would recommend you read. And then we compare that to the Malay Archipelago. The Malay Archipelago was, Dar was Wallace's um, great opus magnus. And again, if we look at some of the work that went into that, you will see um, it is very in-depth. But the one thing that I couldn't quite grasp was in all of their travels, and both men were entomologists, there was no mention at all of any collection of spiders. And that puzzled me. There were brief mentions in both men's work about how horrible spiders were and that they found them to be a hindrance more than an aid. But if you look at the collections, and this picture here is a picture of some of the beetles that Wallace collected on his travels, there are no spiders. There are very, very, very little scant mention of spiders. And that puzzled me, because spiders are easy to catch, easy to find, and quite pretty, but unfortunately, no mention. And that puzzled me. Here is a contemporary painting of the Beagle. It's quite a small ship, as you can see. Um, and you can imagine that would take around about 12 weeks to, to get from uh, England to South America, and that would be rather uncomfortable. But if we look at the travels of Wallace, after he had been to the Amazon, we will see that this, as you can see, is Indochina and Indo-Malay, as it was called, Indo-Malay. And you will see between the islands of Borneo and Sulawesi, there is a red line. Now that red line was drawn arbitrarily onto a map by Wallace because he was confused. Because he couldn't quite understand why that the animals on the west side of the line, that being the orangutan, the proboscis monkey, primates, the meterong, for instance, there were hooved animals, lions, tigers, particularly as we move further west. But to the east of the line, no primates. Instead, marsupials such as the wombat, the koala bear, and the kangaroo or joey. And that confused Wallace, and he couldn't quite understand why. And he put forward the idea that the two land masses of Indochina and Australasia, to the east of that line, had never been connected by a land bridge. This, of course, meant that the animals could not transmigrate across a land bridge, and therefore all the species had 
evolved separately um, and have become completely different. And at the time, of course, it was pure speculation. He had no way of proving that. But today, with modern technology, we do know that the sea between Borneo and Sulawesi is very deep indeed. And indeed, those two land masses have never been just together um, in evolutionary history. So Wallace was pretty bang on the mark. So if we now look at the islands of the Malay archipelago, or as it is now, as I say, the Indonesian archipelago, we will see that Wallace used this sort of boat to travel around the eight years he was there. And this is called a prow. Now, if we look at the first port of call, which would be Singapore, Wallace arrived in Singapore, and using that as his base, he then set out, and if we look at all the places he visited during the eight years he spent, you can see that's pretty, pretty wide and far between. We should also bear in mind that Wallace was travelling done alone, but all just with a single native guide, or a small sh ship's crew, um, and travel to all of these places, many of which are actually fairly dangerous today. In the 19th century would have been even more dangerous and most of the people of the area would probably have never seen a Western European. During his time in Indonesia, Wallace discovered many things and collected many things. He discovered, for instance, the Rajabrook birdling butterfly Trogonoptera brookiana, that he named after his great friend Roger Brook of Sarawa. Beautiful animal and we still seen today. It's difficult to find, but it is possible. He also discovered on the island of Bakan in the Raja Ampat region of uh, Indonesia the golden birdling butterfly, Ornithoptera croesus. I myself was very fortunate recently to have visited the island of Bakan and we actually found this particular species of butterfly on that island. And to my knowledge, it is the only island in the world that has this species of butterfly. This species has probably a five inch wingspan. An absolute stunning butterfly to see. But he didn't stop there. During his time in Indonesia, he traveled 14,000 miles, collected 110,000 insects, 7,500 shells, 8,000 birds, 410 mammals, 200 reptiles and amphibians. So during that time he was fairly busy. And all of these species were collected and sent back to England for resale. But here we have to be careful because we have to be very careful not to apply a 21st century moral on a 19th century mindset. Darwin and Wallace collected animals. They pinned insects, they sent them back to England. Two reasons. One was to sell them to private collections, such as zoos or museums, but also to fund their research. There were no, no TV companies with checkbooks behind them. This was purely uh, to fund their own research and to indeed forward our knowledge of natural history. When it came to Wallace was probably the first European to witness the Red Bird of Paradise. And this was a photograph that uh, Angela, my wife, took recently whilst we were out in um, Indonesia of a stunning pair of Red Bird of Paradise. Uh, just about to mate, actually, and we have that on video somewhere. And you can see, again, only found in this particular reason, region. So Wallace was a groundbreaking naturalist. He's probably also remembered for this strange looking creature. And this is called the Wallace Standard Winged Bird of Paradise. A strange looking bird found only on the island of Dabinga in uh, Indonesia. And as you can see from its blue feathers, and if you, if you ever see the mating rituals of birds of paradise, it is a stunning thing to see. So with all these specimens collected, the question we have to ask ourselves is where do all these specimens end up? Well, most of them end up in museums or private collections. And the photo on the left 
is a private collection in Sarawak, and that is one wall um, of a house which was 10 rooms, and every wall is covered with insects and butterflies. That is a private collection. On the right is a collection from the Natural History Museum in London, and those are insects and beetles collected by Wallace on his travels, and that's just one tray um, of Wallace's collections. And they end up in places like this. Now this, of course, is the Great Museum of Natural History, the British Museum of Natural History, in Kensington, in London. And if you've never been there, you really have to make the effort to visit. What you actually see above ground level at the Natural History Museum is nothing in comparison to what is below ground and behind the scenes. And I've been fortunate in my life to be able to get behind the scenes and to inspect type specimens. Um, and this is how work done. People find type specimens. And those type specimens are usually kept in old jars, like you will see uh, to the right. Um, and this is a very old jar, and you can see the handwriting is very Victorian. And they are kept in vaults, as you can see, under um, perfect cool conditions. And, that, and what happens is people come along and they take jars out and they look at them, and they <coughs> ascertain whether they're new species or describe old species. Um, and it, it's a very um, rewarding job. It's a vocation rather than a career, shall we say. But one of the things that we were interested in is actually finding out whether or not Darwin and Wallace collected spiders. No record, no, no mention of it in any of their books. And then one day, during um, a visit to the museum, a great friend of mine and an arachnologist came across something very interesting. And if you look at the top left-hand picture, it clearly states on the label, Darwin's spiders. And inside those two jars are lots of little test tubes, all with little bits of spiders in them. What a find. Those had sat unnoticed on a shelf for 150 years. <coughs> Excuse me. 150 years. And then Ray decided to start having a closer look at the things in the test tubes. And if you see the photo on the right, these are little bits of spider inside the test tube. And we know that these were from the beagle because that little piece of metal, as you can see, with that number, serial number, relates to the beagle. What a find. So Ray is very, was very pleased with himself, and there we have it. Um, but then he found inside a test tube this. Now, if we look clearly, closely at this left-hand picture at the top, you will see that is without a doubt a pterosaurite, a fang. And that is a downward facing fang. That can only be one type of spider, and that is a tarantula. So now Ray had ascertained that not only had uh, Darwin collected spiders, but he had actually collected tarantulas. And so again, a great. We now know that that species of tarantula that was collected was there something very similar to the chili rose tarantula, which was, was the most widely kept tarantula in the pet trade. Amazing. And Ray wrote a wonderful article that appeared in the Journal of the British Tarantula Society. And a few of us looked at it and very, we were very impressed. And I raised the question, did Wallace therefore collect spiders? We had proven that Darwin had collected spiders, but now we needed to prove that Wallace had collected spiders. We knew that Wallace was very, um, had an inordinate fondness for beetles and collected more species of beetle than any other type of insect. <coughs> Certain species are now named after him. That's a Cera Wallacei, Cera Pallas Wallacei. These are longhorn beetles and he collected hundreds, if not thousands, of these species and Many of them were actually new to science. And again, looking through all the work and all the papers, we could find no, no mention of spiders being collected. We found interesting things, such as Wallace's flying frog, for instance, Acrophorus nigropolomatus, 
uh, a wonderful creature which I was fortunate enough to see myself in Borneo a few years back. And as I mentioned, there's another photograph of the Wallace standard bird wing of paradise. Um, and if we look there, Semiopter Wallace is, is its name now. Again, named after Wallace. We also know, as I've mentioned previously, Thogonopter Brookiana, Roger Brook Birdwing. It's still no mention of spiders. And if we look at the interior of a prime removal forest in the Amazon, and this was a, a typical um, black and white drawing from the period of the time, which actually appears in a book by this man, Henry Bates, you can see there must be scope for collecting spiders. But that brings me nicely onto this gentleman, Henry Walter Bates. Because in Henry Walter Bates's book, who was a travelling companion of Wallace when he went to the Amazon, in his book, The Naturalist on the River Amazon, he produced what we now know is the first um, recorded mention of a bird eating tarantula. <clears throat> and in fact, a wonderful picture appears in that very book. And here it is. And from that book, you can see, from that picture, you can see clearly that these bird-eating tarantulas, the Miguel avicularia, which they are, of course, now avicularia avicularia, attacking finches. But how true that is, we don't know, poetic or artistic license, shall we say. So we know that Wallace had been in contact with spiders, but again, the description in this book by Bates clearly states that these are evil denizens of the forest with this vile venom liquor that they inject into poor unsuspecting birds. It was difficult. So we return to the Malay Archipelago, the book that Wallace wrote on his return from Indonesia in 1958. And he published his book and we poured through it to see if we could find any mention of spiders. But still, no spiders, no collecting. It was becoming very perplexing. We then decided that we would go deeper into this and we went to the Natural History Museum and looked through the notebooks of Alfred Russell Wallace, which are still around today, and you can see um, very, very difficult to transcribe, and my thanks to George Beccoloni of the, um, the Wallace Fund um, for actually, <coughs> excuse me, for actually um, having a project which translates these letters, which makes it much easier. And we started to find that each consignment that Wallace had collected had been meticulously recorded, species, everything had been written down, and had been sent back to, to be sold. This, of course, meant that somewhere, had Wallace collected spiders, it would be in a consignment. And so, we went further. We realised that Alfred Russell Wallace, his record of all his consignments, were to this guy, Samuel Stevens. Samuel Stevens was an agent. His job um, was to take um, receivership of the um, insects that arrived and the consignments and then to sell them on to museums, private collectors, etc. And he did it very well. He sold them to many, many different outlets and by all accounts was quite a, an eccentric character and by the look of the photo I'm sure you get that impression. And you see there are some drawings from Wallace's original notebooks all still in existence. So, if we look now, the remaining orders of insects are in the collection of Mr. William Wilson Saunders, who has caused a larger portion of them to be described by good entomologists. That is written by um, Stevens, um, and it shows that he sold a lot of this collection to Mr. William Wilson Saunders. Now, Mr. Wilson William Saunders was um, very uh, high, high up in the Amateur Entomological Society, and although he was an entomologist, not an arachnologist, um, and, and he wrote this book, Insect um, Sondersiana, again, a catalogue of, of a lot of the insects that he had been sold. But his main interest being entomology, he had no real interest in spiders. 
What we do know is that later in his life, he um, suffered financial hardship and he sold his entire collection to this man, the Reverend Octavius Picard Cambridge. <clears throat> now, Cambridge was an English clergyman and above all, an arachnologist who gave us a wonderful book called The Spiders of Dorset. If Saunders had sold his collection to Cambridge, there must have been spiders in it because, as I've said, Cape Picard Cambridge was an arachnologist first and foremost. <clears throat> so, so, Reverend Picard Cambridge then wrote a paper, we searched through his papers, and he wrote a paper entitled On Some New and Little Known Spiders. This very short article was written in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London, dated the 15th of December, 1896. And there's the paper. And that is all of the paper. But that is interesting. Because if we look at it, we can see on the top left, you will see a wonderful drawing of a spider. If we then read the paper, we will see that the spider is called Friula wallacei. And at the very bottom of that paper, you will see, found by Dr. A. R. Wallace of Sarawak many years ago, having obtained from the collection of the late Mr. William Saunders, and that was identified by Wallace himself on a visit to the Museum of Natural History to talk to Cambridge, Picard Cambridge, and it was actually identified by himself. So we know that Wallace collected spiders. At this moment, only one. But nevertheless, one is better than none. And that is the entire paper. Now, that is a strange-looking spider. I'm sure you would agree. But there are spiders. There are spiders that look very strange. And this is a Gastrocantha species, I believe that's the Macrocantha um, species now, um, Archuata. And this is found in Borneo. And you can see there is a similarity. But the two spines on the Gastrocantha, Macrocantha Archuata are pointed and not uh, bulbous, as in Friola So this is a very similar species. But it is not the same. And now we look at facts. The Reverend Picard Cambridge was sold his collection by Mr. William Saunders. So now I knew the following. Wallace had indeed collected spiders. He had collected them in Sarawak. One particular shipment had been sold by Stevens to William Wilson Saunders. Saunders had sold them to Octavius Picard Cambridge, who had described Friula Wallacei. That's all very well. So we know that Wallace did indeed collect spiders. The problem we have now is where was the type specimen? Because this is all very well, but without a type specimen, to prove that that spider exists, worthless. And so we set upon another quest. How to find this type. And if we look at a pictorial representation of this little detective work that we have going, we'll see that Wallace sold his collection and uh, sent his collection to Stevens, the agent. Stevens sold them to Saunders. Saunders sold them to Picard Cambridge. Picard Cambridge worked at the Museum of Natural History, the uh, Oxford Museum, University Museum of Natural History. <clears throat> he worked there, and on his death, his entire collection was bequeathed to the museum. The trial was getting hot. I needed to get to the Museum of Natural History in, in Oxford. But I needed to get in. And who did we know that was a um, associate researcher at the Museum of Natural History in Oxford? None other than this fellow, Ray Gabriel. 
Now you will recall, have you been listening, that Ray Gabriel was the man who discovered Darwin's spider. And although I say it stuck in my throat to actually actual approach him, um, Ray was very instrumental in helping me find <clears throat> and to search the vaults of the museum to find something very interesting. He found, there is the original drawing that we know the specimen looks like from 1896. And after a little bit of searching, this was discovered. And this is specimen number 166 from the um, Oxford University Museum of Natural History. And thank you for Ray Gabriel for um, getting these, um, these images. <coughs> and that is the type specimen of Boyula Wallasai. It's probably about a centimetre long, it's not big, but it is a strange creature. So now we had found the type specimen of the other Wallace site. The question is, does that species still exist in the wild, or is it in fact extinct? There was only one thing to do, and that was to go to Borneo. So, after some research of where we needed to go into Borneo and to, um, there was no, Borneo is a big country, so you really need to know where Wallace had been, <coughs> where Wallace had been, how long he had spent at these places, who he had met, what he had collected where, and that was a big trip. It took us about three years to collate all the information together, where we needed to be, at what season, what time, because obviously animals have seasons, um, and we ar eventually arrived in Borneo. Now this is <coughs> the Malay part of Borneo. The map on the right is um, Borneo Island. You can see it's made up of uh, four distinct states. We have Sabah, which is a Malay state to the north. We have Sarawak, which is also a Malay state um, lower down. We have the big area, which is Kalimantan, which is Indonesian. And the small area is Brunei Darussalam. It's a big island. It's the third largest island in the world and pretty difficult to get around. Now, we knew that Wallace had arrived, as most visitors do to Sarawak, he had arrived in Kuching and had immediately become a guest of the um, Raja. <clears throat> so the first thing we did is we found ourselves a team. Um, these two young guys are arachnologists, and very, very keen arachnologists and I had contacted them and they agreed to take time off from their very busy, hectic social and um, professional schedule to basically ferry myself and Angela around Kuching for three weeks. And so we arrived mob handed, as you can see, equipment in hand, um, ready to spend three weeks on the road looking for this spider. <coughs> But in order to do this, we needed to know, as I've said, exactly where we were going. You can't just wander around Borneo hoping that you may come across this spider. You need to be where Wallace was. Wallace arrived with his young assistant, Charles Allen, on Kuching on the 1st of November, 1854. He was immediately made welcome by the then Raja of Sarawak, the Englishman James Brook, as you think this is the English James Brook in the slide and invited to stay um, over Christmas, over the period of time, um, and to spend time at Roger Brooks' summer house up um, in the hills, um, because Brook himself was a keen entomologist, and so the two men had much in common. This is the Sarawak River, and you can see um, it's still pretty uh, dense forest, and as you approach Kuching along the Sarawak River, which Wallace would have done, he would have seen this particular site. Um, so it, it, there is still quite a lot of forest there. But so this is a Kuching area map. And the first thing we needed to see um, was that we knew um, that in the first four months of their arrival in uh, Sarawak, um, Wallace had visited um, Santobong at its mouth at the mouth of the Sarawak River, and also the gold fields up there. And we see to the top is Santabong, and the bottom are the um, gold mines of Bell. So we knew that Wallace had spent time there. We also know 
He had then travelled the river Sadong, staying at Simonjan for nine months before returning to Kuching. And there is the uh, Simonjan, the Sadong River. And we also knew that he would have travelled from Kuching by boat along the coast and then up the river Sadong. But that option was uh, not feasible for us. So we had to use a road and that is the road uh, that we had to go. So you can see it was quite a, a, a jaunt, but these two guys were quite keen to do it. Um, and that drive was probably about five hours. So that was quite a, quite a tough drive, particularly because if we, as we had to get to Simonjan, we had to travel on roads like this. And the roads, that's one of the good roads. Um, that's the main road out of Kuching. As we approached Simonjan, the roads got particularly worse. <clears throat> On our arrival in Simonjan, we immediately set about um, trying to find the area that Wallace had collected in. And we knew that Wallace had collected in the area of the coal mines in Simonjan, which the Chinese had started to dig. So we literally knew where we had to look. Now, that is quite a jaunt, because as you can see, um, the guide at the very front um, was very, very fit. Alex, um, one of our team members, um, is in front. <clears throat> and there is Andrew, of course, looking very hot and flustered, simply because it is round about 100% humidity and about 38 degrees. So it's pretty warm. But that is ideal country what we, for the spider we were looking for. We eventually arrived at the coal mines of um, Simunjan, and although the coal mines now are deserted, the coal ran out a long time ago and the Chinese left, the mines are of course still there. And although you can go in some of these mines, I wouldn't recommend it. They are not safe, they are, a lot of them are full of water, um, <clears throat> and it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Um, a lot of them are actually capped and blocked off so you can't really get in. But it should be remembered that these caves do harbour some lovely animals, scholar pendulars, um, scutigera, centipedes, bats, spiders, all sorts. From our point of view, a worthwhile investigation. Now, although there is still quite a lot of greenery around Simonjan, it should be noted that Wallace does say that in at his time of visiting, most of the area of Simonjan had been deforested. Um, but from an entomologist's point of view, deforestation meant dead trees, dead trees meant beetles, <clears throat> beetles living of course on rotten wood. So there was a lot to be found and there still is a lot to be found out there. This unfortunately is the view from that very cave and if you look very closely you will see that there is, that the square area you see in front of you is palm plantation. Palm plantation I'm afraid is all over the tropics, particularly in Borneo. Um, wherever there is a, a, a spare inch of land, it is, it is literally taken up with palm oil plantation. But again, that's a, an argument for another day. What we did find around the area of Simunjan are wonderful dragonflies, uh, like this one for instance, which is a beautiful creature. We found some wonderful, strange looking beetles. Um, as indeed Wallace had found many types of beetles, including this fellow who insisted on landing upon Angela, a wonderful little beetle. Um, we also found something very interesting, which was this. Now, until recently, that spider um, hadn't been described. It was quite an unusual looking spider. And as you can see, um, the previous um, sighting of this spider had been in the Malayal Basin which is um, in Sabah, um, and to my knowledge it hadn't been seen in this area where we were in Simunjan and Sarawak, um, so that was quite a, an inspirational find really. It's a beautiful spider, um, but it's not what we're looking for. We also found, of course, our old friend Macrocantha arcuata. Lots of them around, but not the spider we were looking for. Who knows? We, we carried on looking. We, we, we were not going to give up. 
Having spent three days at Simunjan, we realised that we've really exhausted um, the area. Um, a lot of it now, it's not built up, but a lot of it is road, a lot of it is over to private farms, <clears throat> and they grow chilies. So a lot of it really is, is now domesticated. So from a, a wildlife point of view, it's not really a lot there to see. Um, in Wallace's day, there were a lot of orangutan. There are no orangutan there in Simunjan. So we decided to cut our losses. We returned to our hotel and basically decided the next day that we would visit Peninjo and Bo. Now, Peninjo and Bo are to the south of Kuching. <coughs> we know that Wallace had spent time at um, Bo, which is the gold fields the, where the gold miners worked. And Bukit Peninjo was where Roger Brook had his summer cottage. And if you read the Malay Archipelago, um, Wallace describes Peninjo as an absolute haven for collecting of insects, particularly moths and butterflies. So we decided we would go and visit these two places <clears throat> and see what we could find. Finding Bukit Peninjo proved to be more difficult than it sounded. Um, when Wallace originally visited Peninjo, or Bukit Peninjo, of course, he would have been taken there by the Roger Brooks loyal servants. We were taken there by two very keen, but certainly uh, inexperienced young men um, in, a, in a car. Um, it is a very diff easy place to miss because driving along the road, there is a simple little road sign which says Bukit Peninjo. There is no other reference at all to finding the area. But thankfully for the use of um, GPS coordinates, we found where we were going. We arrived at the, the small area and walked into a little tiny building and inside that building it explained that this, as you can see before you, was what Brooks Cottage originally looked like. <clears throat> it was no longer there. It had obviously been made of wood, but there were plans for it to be rebuilt. And in fact it was being in the process of rebuilt on the summit of Bukit Benjo at the time. We spoke to a gentleman who said, mm, if you're going up there, you have to be careful because it would be a difficult climb. It was probably about two and a half to three hours. It was wet. Um, it didn't look that good, promising weather, but we decided we would chance it. And so we set off. On the way to Brook Cottage, <clears throat> this is not Brook's Cottage. This is about maybe 150, 200 metres um, up the hill. And it's an old, old um, shack that was built, but it would be similar to what we were looking for. An interesting side here, on the way up um, to this cottage, and that's us on the way up. As you can see, it's very slippery, it's very wet, and it's very dangerous. On the way up, we were passed by four native dyaks on the way down. And those dyaks, we stopped them and we chatted to them. <clears throat> and we asked them how long it would take us to get to the top of Bukit Peninja. And one of the Dayaks said the speed that we are walking um, about 20 minutes, but the speed that you are walking about four hours. Um, and they thought that was quite hilarious. And bear in mind that we were kitted, we were booted up, we were ready. These guys had no shoes on and were skipping over these rocks with no problem at all. Um, and they were also carrying very large lengths, long lengths of wood because they were the guys renovating the cottage. So we continued on up for about a mile, I suppose, until we actually then gave up because the weather had turned, the rain had started to come in, and, and we <clears throat> made the decision that we would abandon the trip. However, nothing never be downhearted. On the way down, we found some very interesting um, animals. This one, which is Wallace's um, solar palace beetle on a tree. Beautiful looking creature, as you can see, rather large um, beetle. We also found this. Again, another species of longhorn beetle. Just look at the antennae. Um, lots of species of beetle still there. Lots of rotten wood, lots, lots of lobster town. And we found this. 
Again, it's a spider, there is no doubt about it, but it's a heteropoda species. It's close, but it's not right. It's not the one we're looking for. We came across this, which is a gastrocanthus species. Again, very similar to Friula wallacei in shape. If you look at the shape and the format of the spider, <clears throat> but those two protrusions on the side are not bulbous, they are not extended. This is not um, gastrocanthus, uh, this is not Friula wallacei. Um, this is a gastrocanthus species, but it's close. So we knew we were on the right track. It's the, the right area um, and the right type of spider. <coughs> As we approached the bottom, um, there was a large area. And if you look, it says there clearly that there is a climathon. Um, and how anyone runs up that mountain rather than, rather than climb it very slowly, I have no idea. Um, but there we go, myself and Angela. Um, in our um, adventurous explorer gear, I suppose, uh, looking very pleased with ourselves, although having not found the spider, a little bit disappointed. On the way back, one of our guides <coughs> or our team said to us, I think in an effort to cheer us up really, um, are you guys interested in flowers? And we both said we were, uh, being keen orchid growers in England, um, and he said that he had a friend a Taiwanese friend who had a private um, nursery and he sold exported exotic flowers and would we like to have a break and stay there and just have a cup of tea and have a look and we agreed readily we arrived at um, the nursery and as you can see lots of different types of flowers and plants bromeliads um, many many species of plants including these um, on the right is nepenthes of course the pitcher plants this guy was an expert on pitcher plants lots of different species of pitcher plants that grow at only certain altitudes um, in borneo and of course on the left uh, an orchid and the guy was a very keen orchid grower <coughs> from our point of view it was interesting and we found it very educational and then the owner of the nursery said something to us he said, are you the guys who like spiders? And we of course said yes. And he said, I know where there is a spider which is five inches across. Now, if you keep spiders, or you know anything about spiders, or if you look for spiders in the wild, there is always someone who will tell you that they have seen a five inch spider, usually in the back. And you tend to think, that after a while, you sort of take it with a pinch of salt looked at the guy and I went, five inches. And he went, you don't think I know what I'm talking about. He says, but I'm telling you, I know the difference between a tarantula and a spider. And he says, and I'm telling you, I can take you now to a place where there, is five, there are five inch tarantulas. <clears throat> we couldn't turn away the opportunity. So we re-kitted, had a quick um, freshen up, his wife supplying us with wonderful lunch and tea. Um, and we set off. After a while of wandering through the area, the forest, we came across this, and this is a cave in the undergrowth, a limestone cave. The only problem was to get to that cave, in front of us was a river. Now, this is a photograph taken on the second day of our visit, because on the day that we actually tried to cross that river, that water level was up to probably Angela's waist, where Angela's waist is now. And it would have been impossible. It was fast flowing river. It would have been impossible to cross that river. However, um, our new friend said to us that we would return the next day because the water level would recede and we would be able to cross. And the next day, true enough, we arrived. And as you can see, um, we crossed and there is Angela. Um, trousers rolled up wading through the river now what was interesting we should bear in mind this this is mind this is still rainforest and it is still fairly wild because as we were wading across that river river came a snake <laughs> swimming quite uh, adequately along um, which the young guy at the back the very back uh, lad at the back decided to um, chase along the river i believe he actually caught it and photographed it 
On arrival to the other side of the river, we found the cave. And as you can see, we prepared to enter the cave, um, head torches, knee guards, um, making sure we the torches all there, everything we need. <clears throat> and I asked the guide, where were the spiders? And he said, oh, unfortunately, they're not in this cave. They're in a cave further back. That's fine. It's a big cave. I was happy. And we started to walk towards the back of the cave. And the roof became lower. And there you can see Angela leading the way, bless her. Um, and the cave became lower and lower and lower <clears throat> until we actually found ourselves on our hands and knees, crawling along the, the floor. Now this cave was pitch dark, only the light from our head torches illuminated. There were many creepy crawlers in that cave, particularly put together the long-legged centipede. There was Scolopendra wriggling on the floor. Um, there were a number of meta-species, meta spider species, cave spiders, um, cave crickets. And in fact, if you turned your light out, it wasn't long before something was crawling on you. I remember asking him, I said, how far is this, this, this cave go to the back? And he said, probably about 50 metres. Now, I have missed, if Angela hadn't have gone to the front and I hadn't got three people behind me, I probably wouldn't have gone in because I don't particularly like enclosed spaces. But spiders don't bother me and creepy crawlies, but being in the dark in a small space um, worries me. But nevertheless, we, we managed to, on our hands and knees, and we eventually arrived in a very large, in fact a huge, pitch black chamber. We switched our head torches on, and we put our full beam torches on, and there on the floor was this. The first obvious sign of a tarantula burrow. And within seconds, as we um, the, our torches lit the floor, <clears throat> we noticed there were not only one tarantula burrow, there were probably a thousand tarantula burrows. And that's no exaggeration. This was a large cave, large sealed cave, no light. And this white was all over the floor, everywhere. We also noticed that sitting just outside most of the burrows <clears throat> were very large tarantulas and our torch beams picked their eyes up so we knew they were big. Now if you've ever, um, if you keep tarantulas or if you've seen them in the wild you'll know that a tarantula sitting at the edge of a burrow is waiting for food um, and any noise or disturbance and that spider will sink back into its burrow and make it very, very difficult to extract. <clears throat> It was made more difficult by the fact that this wasn't really soft ground. And if we look at the next slide, you'll see there is the cave on the outside. Those big, large round things are solid um, limestone boulders or and granite boulders which have fallen from the roof, so you, you're not going to move them. Um, and the spiders, for some reason, had, uh, well, for protection, had basically um, dug their burrows into the gravel-like uh, substrate um, down the edge of these um, very, very large rocks, which were very deeply buried. Um, and then the whole surface had been covered by bat guano, um, which made it slimy and very difficult to dig. It was virtually impossible to dig a tarantula out. And in circumstances like this, the moment you make any noise, this happens. Those spiders retreat into their burrows, and you have absolutely no chance of digging them out. There's only one foolproof method to get a tarantula out of the burrow in this situation, and that is to flood the burrow with water. It doesn't hurt the spider, but the spider vacates almost immediately. And as you can see, fill the burrow with water, and the spider runs out. That's the theory. That should then allow you to quite easily catch the spider uh, in a container. That was the theory. Unfortunately, when we flooded the, the, the burrow, that spider came out like a bullet train and was up and gone all over the walls. It took us probably about two hours to perfect our technique. Um, but within that two hours, um, we found a great deal of spiders. 
including this one. Now this was under a loose rock. We turned the rock over and underneath the rock was this. Now this is an adult female tarantula with an egg sac. Now that female tarantula is no longer than about one inch, 2.5 centimeters. That's an adult tarantula. We know it's adult, it has an egg sac. But what was also amazing about this particular species is when we lifted the rock, if you look at the silk tunnels under that rock, which was not big, there was an adult female with an egg sac. There was an adult mature male, just off picture. There was um, a number of juveniles and there were last year's spiderlings, all under one rock. So there is a whole ecosystem all living under one rock. Now this species is probably what we call a flagella species. It's a small, as tall as a brand job. Um, and it's of interest, it's very interesting, but it's more than likely to be flagellus. On the other hand, we were interested in what lay beyond. These guys. Now these guys were big. They were probably about five inches um, leg span. They were not aggressive. Um, they had no need to be aggressive. They lived in the dark. They uh, lived off the cave crickets and the East Pendra um, when they were looked for. Well, those Scolopendra um, are known predators of tarantulas. It's, it's a pretty tough fight for either one of them. And if you look at that, that is a typical burrow of the, this tarantula. The top section is rock, the bottom section is hard gravel, and she is, is literally spun between the hard gravel and the rock. Virtually impossible to extract, as I've said. So we looked elsewhere. Very soon we started to find burrows, some burrows actually straight into the softer substrate and telltale signs, pure white silk around. But there was no doubt these are tarantulas and they are big tarantulas. There you can see Angela and myself in action. Um, the blue container, the container on the plastic container, the idea was that we would corral the spider through a canyon of two rocks and it would run into a container. Um, again, that's all very well in principle, it doesn't always work. Um, but we managed to collect quite a few of the photograph. You can also see from that photograph that I'm sweating. I'm pretty hot and it's down and dirty. And the problem is simple, is that is a cave which is sealed off from the outside world. The air inside it is fairly stagnant, there's very little airflow, and it is very wet and humid inside and very hot. After about two hours of doing this, we were becoming very disorientated. The torch batteries were starting to go, <clears throat> and we made the decision that we would take the spider that we had collected, take it outside into the light, and photograph it. Very difficult to photograph in pitch, dark, pitch darkness, so we made the decision that we would remove the spider from the cave and take it out to be photographed in the light. <clears throat> we would also, I would add, return that spider back into the cave the same day after we had some fresh air and put it back into the burrow from which we took it. So that is, that is paramount. We are researchers, we are photographers, we are not collectors of spiders. And plus the fact it's illegal um, and this is, a, this, is a, this is an ecosystem that has not been touched for millions of years. Who are we to, to disturb it to this effect? This was the spider that we actually managed to collect. She was quite a big girl. That was one of the smaller spiders, but there were, there were I, I, we estimated there were probably four or five different species of tarantula in that cave. And she was probably a big flow jealousy, but it's about two and a half inches, maybe three inches, but she was quite big. But this one, on the other hand, was the one that we really prized. Because we think this could well be a new species, or perhaps even a new genus. In the light, photographed out in the forest, those legs are definitely purple. But what made it more interesting for us is if we look closely at the eyes, because on all the specimens of the spiders that we collected in that cave to photograph, every single spider, their eyes were glazed over and white. 
And from that we can not assume, but we can perfectly we can spit that this spider is probably blind or has very, very poor eyesight. After all, it doesn't need eyesight to see. It doesn't need its eyes. There is no light in the cave. So over time, perhaps these eyes are not only evolving to be not used, but one day they may even evolve to be disappeared altogether. Very pleased with that photograph. And this photograph is Angela looking very pleased with herself with her container. And this is the guy um, after whom we will probably one day name the spider when we get around to doing the paper on it. Um, he was very, very <coughs> um, spider orientated. And so we have to thank him for his enthusiasm uh, in showing us this cave. I would stress again that once we had photographed that spider, the spider was replaced back in the cave and no spiders were taken from that, that site. This brings us to a, probably another quandary really, is that if you write a paper on that spider, you would have to say exactly where it is. Its coordinates, how it can be found, how you get to it. And the real reality is this. If we write that paper, I dare say somebody will, in their infinite wisdom, decide to visit that cave and take as many of our spiders out as they can. To what end? There really is no purpose. They are brown spiders. It's a new species, more than likely. More, certainly more, more often than not, it's a new species, more likely than not. But why? The cave has been undisturbed for centuries, um, and long may it be that way. The original quest to find Wallace's spider, had it been successful? Well, did we find what we were looking for? Well, we found some very interesting things, including a new species of tarantula. We found some wonderful butterflies. We found some wonderful, large Borneo Saba stick insects. We found hundreds of species of longhorn beetles, and they are beautiful without a doubt. And I can see Wallace's attraction to them. But did we find what we were looking for? Did we prove that Wallace's spider still exists in the world? Simply, no. However, better luck next time, because I can guarantee you one thing. Keep calm, I'll be back. We will return to Borneo when all this is over, COVID-19 is finished. We will return to Sarawak and we will find that spider, unless someone beats me to it. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you've enjoyed this, this wonderful new way of giving lectures to you guys. It has been my privilege and my honour and my pleasure to speak to you tonight. Thank you. Thanks to Ray for that wonderful presentation. Uh, Ray will be back next year giving us a presentation at the meet in person, uh, which is which is everything that we'd want because it would be fantastic to listen to that. Sat in front of him and ask him all the questions that I'm sure you've got to ask. If anybody does have any questions, I mean, feel free to, to post them on the the page Ray will get back to you we'll, we'll tag Ray in if need be but I hope you really enjoy the presentation um, and on to the next one the next one will be Daryl Lott uh, Rhinos in Crisis don't let me go how we're going to work that one at this present moment is to be decided um, unfortunately if there's a slim slim chance we'll be we'll be meeting and that's the reality of it. It's, it's the current situation. Um, but I'm sure we can get Daryl along to do his presentation online. And we look forward to that as any. On that note, I think I should also say we will be also be postponing the Wales meet. There hasn't been an announcement on that. But the Wales meet will also be postponed purely because of the climate. But once again, thanks to Ray. Anybody has any questions, feel free to drop a message, post on the page and enjoy it. Hope you're all staying home, staying safe. Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.